Take a look at how affordable an old Vancouver house has now become. Pardon the sarcasm. Someone paid nearly $1.6 million for this house in 2017. It recently sold for a $230,000 loss. Vancouver and Detroit had one strange thing in common over these past few years. Each city had thousands of empty homes. In Detroit, these homes were worth nothing. But in Vancouver, these abandoned homes were worth at least $1 million and up. The crazy real estate speculation in Vancouver led to the online game of Crack Shack or Mansion, as it was impossible to tell the difference just looking from the street. Google Crack Shack or Mansion and have fun playing that game, because you just won't believe it until you see it. People from all over the world, celebrities, immigrants, gangsters, and tons of regular folks were scrambling to get a taste of the never-ending boom of the Vancouver real estate market. And how did a 60-year-old tear-down house suddenly become $1.6 million? Or even more? <laughs> Let me tell you this story. Vancouver was always a place where Canadians who didn't like the cold winters wanted to live. So like many large cities, it always commanded a premium on the cost of living. Vancouver was, and still is, the San Francisco of Canada. But several major events in the past 30 years pushed lots of money into the local economy. It all really started with the 1986 World Expo, or as we call it, Expo 86 that really put Vancouver on the map and suddenly the outside world knew about us. With the exception of a recession in the early 90s, Vancouver home prices grew at a steady but manageable pace. Back then, a family of two could afford a home on a ratio of income to house price of one to six ratio or maybe one to eight, depending on where and when you purchased your home. And then the foreign money came when Britain handed over Hong Kong. Now, Hong Kong people are to run Hong Kong. That is the promise, and that is the unshakable destiny. Many affluent citizens of Hong Kong were afraid what might happen after the communist takeover, and many left, at least temporarily. Canada had many programs that the wealthy could purchase their way into Canada with cash. And so they came, and they came to Vancouver because it was close, and it had many long-established Asian cultures already embedded within its social fabric so they felt very comfortable coming to Vancouver. Year over year increases of real estate values were routinely 5 to 10 percent and did not stop. It did not stop for 9-11. It did not stop for the American recession of 2008. It only continued. And then this happened to make things even more expensive. The International Olympic Committee has the honor of announcing that the 21st Olympic Winter Games in 2010 are awarded to the city of Vancouver. The 2010 Vancouver Olympics only made Vancouver a greater target on the world stage for more speculation. Not only for local citizens, but from people all over the world. Organized crime, fake immigrants, students, speculators, and anyone who could scrape up a down payment was gaming the market for a guaranteed profit. People even stood in line at pre-sales of condominiums that didn't even have a shovel in the ground yet just to flip the contracts of the right to purchase, and pocketed ten of thousands of dollars tax-free on each transaction. Meanwhile, absentee owners from China and other countries were leaving thousands of their mansions to rot in Vancouver as they gamed the Canadian immigration system to pretend they were living in Canada but were actually secretly living in Asia or elsewhere. Gangsters would complete their real estate deals the Canadian way with hockey bags stuffed with cash. In the process, cleaning their ill-gotten money due to Canada's weak ability to track proceeds of crime. The sophisticated organized crime members even created elaborate shell corporations to hold their vast real estate empires. After all, it only took a Canadian attorney less than an hour to set this up, and they were more than happy to receive the business. Even the small local gangsters merely used straw buyers to hold their property investments. The result? Billions of dollars poured into the local economy. Even the Canadian casinos were used to clean up some of this dirty cash to help buy real estate. 
Gangsters called it the Vancouver Maneuver. Soon, an old 60-year-old house was worth $1 million and rising, and the investors were happy. And then, of course, after the politicians themselves also got rich with their land appreciation, they decided to wake up. Suddenly, there were few workers available who could afford to live in Vancouver for the low-paid service industry jobs in restaurants and coffee shops. And the next generation of people could not afford to live in these neighborhoods. And soon Vancouver discovered that most of the $3 million homes in Vancouver were owned by numbered corporations, absentee foreign landlords, and foreign students and homemakers who declared a $20,000 income to the tax department. In what real world can homemakers and students own $3 million properties? Only in Vancouver was this a common thing. And then came the taxes and government to crack down on the madness, as they always do late in the game. It's a sidewalk struggle. You guys here for any open house? <laughs> Realtor David Hutchinson takes to the streets to generate interest in a Vancouver condo. Show us around, what do we have here? 563 square feet. The new reality in Vancouver real estate is that prices are down. So are the number of sales. Two years ago, this same unit would have been $80,000 more and there would have been a lineup to buy it. You didn't have to do too much. You put your signs out, you put it on the MLS and uh, you, let, you open the door and let the buyers in and present the offers to the seller and uh, you feel like a hero. He blames a host of new taxes and fees brought in by the federal, provincial and local governments to cool the market. Municipal taxation, the empty homes tax. Provincial level, we've got a speculator tax, a school tax, a foreign buyer tax. Federal level, we have the mortgage stress test. So what is the future? Probably a long and protracted slide of real estate prices to get them back to levels of sanity. Many realtors I speak to are not working as there's too much inventory and too few buyers these days. The ratio of people wanting to sell out and run with the cash versus the new suckers and investors willing to buy in is increasing each and every day. Every month here in Vancouver is starting to look like a musical chairs game with the smart money cashing out as quick as possible. This leaves the local families that need their homes to live in to just hold tight and suck up any potential loss in equity that will inevitably happen. Soon, even you might be able to buy that crack shack in Vancouver for a lousy $800,000 if you dare to tread in one of the most illogical real estate markets the world has ever seen. Stuart Bonner is hoping to make a sale. This compact two-bedroom is on the market for just shy of a million dollars. But if you have any questions, let me know. Bonner's seen and, thousands um, of house hunters come and go over the four decades he's been a real estate agent. And lately, he's seen the effects of money laundering. I mean, when you get, when you get a couple of years of 20% increases in price point, that's like, what's driving that? Two reports out of BC yesterday answered that question, concluding $7 billion worth of dirty money helped drive up the price of housing in Vancouver by at least 5% last year alone. But the criminals have been creative in other ways. The report says money is also being washed through purchases of luxury boats, college tuition, cars, grand pianos, even fishing quotas. 